Welcome to Mount Gilead General Baptist Church. It's a joy and a privilege to have you here today. This is the day the Lord has made, and we all rejoice and be glad in it. Let me just mention that uh, I do know that the uh, leadership team pulpit search committee are beginning to receive some resumes and that type of thing. And I share that with you only primarily to say this. Let us remember that group of people within our prayers. God has His person that He's chosen to eventually come here and be your pastor. We need that man and his wife and their family to recognize God's calling upon their lives. And we as a congregation need to recognize God's calling upon their life. So let us remember that group very much within our prayers. Do not take up a formal offering right now with COVID-19, but there's an offering plate at both doors. I want to remind you that we are to be stewards of all that God has blessed us with, and that means that including our tithes and offerings. And I want to encourage you to remember upon the first day of the week, the early church came together. And when they came together, each one gave as God had blessed them. And if God has blessed you, I want to encourage you to give your tithes and offerings to the Lord. Any other announcements that should be made? If not, in 1 Chronicles, we read these words at the dedication of the temple. Sing to the Lord all ye earth. Proclaim His salvation day after day. Declare His glory among the nations, His marvelous deeds among the people. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Let us stand together and sing to the Lord all the earth. Let us join together.
so glad to be worshiping with you this morning. Um, as we go into this next song today, um, I just want you guys to think about the trials that you've been facing in your life. You know, you may have financial trouble or you may have a health problem going on or maybe there's just something going on in your family. And then on a bigger scale, let's think about our country and let's think about the world that we live in. Um, you know, let's just declare, let's just declare victory over all these situations that's going on right now. You know, we know that we have victory in Jesus Christ. You know, He overcame the world and He can overcome your trials if we just believe in Him and put our faith in Him.
glad this morning that I can sing it as well with my soul. I love um, the line in the chorus of that song where it says, through it all, my eyes are on you. You know, we have to keep our eyes on Jesus because whenever the storm is raging all around us, he is the only one who remains in control. In the eye of the storm, you remain in control. In the middle of the war, you guard my soul. You alone are the anchor when my sails are torn. Your love surrounds me in the eye of the storm. When the solid ground is falling out from underneath my feet, between the black skies and my red eyes, I can barely see. And when I realize I've been sold out by my friends and my family, I can feel the rain reminding me in the eye of the storm. just now, Lord, just to thank you and praise you for your great love for us. And dear God, we come this morning to worship you and to bring honor and glory to your name. And Lord, as we have assembled together, we pray, Father, that your spirit might uh, come and be our army. It's, Lord, we thank you for uh, these that have uh, led us in worship this morning. And dear God, we just pray that you might uh, continue to, to be with us in this service. Pray for Ray as he comes to preach your word. We pray that it might be words that will speak to our hearts and pray that our hearts might be open to receive those words. Lord, we pray for all the needs within our church today. Lord, there's so many that are, are sick and in need and different problems that they have in their families. Dear God, we just pray that you might uh, be with each one. Lord, just now, we ask that you might uh, move in this service, touch hearts, change lives. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we will be speaking from the book of Matthew, the 14th chapter, beginning with verse 30 to 22 through verse 32. Starting a new series today, be preaching the next few weeks, and if there's one theme that I could just give you, it would really be this, weathering the storms. 
This is the Sea of Galilee at a time of great storms. An actual picture of the Sea of Galilee during a great storm. Uh, I don't know about you, but it seems like to me that there's a lot of storms in life. And uh, I would like for us to think about weathering the storms. And today, I would especially like for you to think with me about where do these storms come from that we have to weather? Let us look together at the book of Matthew, the 14th chapter, beginning with verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. Now when evening came, he was alone there. But the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves, for the wind was contrary. Now in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went to them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost! And they cried out for fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Be a good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered and said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus, but when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately, Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, Oh, you little faith, why do you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Every day there is a storm that is raging someplace upon the face of the earth. Wednesday, September 9th, this week, the National Weather Report had three things that they were talking about. And by the way, <laughs> They're still talking about some of it today. 2000, the headline says, forced to flee as fires rage in the west. One of the earliest snowfalls on record in Colorado. Four active systems in busy Atlantic right now. And now I think it's up to like six or seven. Isn't it amazing? Some place in the world, all each and every day, there is a storm that is raging. And whether you and I talk about it a whole lot, it is true even within our lives. Someone you know is today going through a great raging storm. Someone seated in this sanctuary this morning is going through a great raging storm. In fact, there's an old saying that goes something like this. God only has you in three different places. You're either going through a storm, you're coming out of a storm, or God is just now preparing you to enter a storm. But somehow or another, storms cannot be evaded Storms are going to creep into our lives whether we want them to or not. In our text, we see Jesus having just heard in the 14th chapter about the death of a beloved cousin by the name of John the Baptist who had gone before him. He heard about his death and he seeks to go into a solitary place to be alone with the Father. But when he departs to go into that solitary place, others begin to hear where he is going and they go ahead of him. And soon Jesus is surrounded by a crowd. He and his disciples are there ministering to them. In fact, the 14th chapter of this, this chapter 
uh, the 14th verse says that Jesus looked upon the multitude and he was moved with compassion for them and he healed their sick. He worked within their midst. The afternoon was coming and people were beginning to get a little hungry and they needed food and Jesus turned to his disciples and asked them where food were, was at and they said, you know, we don't know what you're talking about. There's no food here because all we can find are five loaves of bread and two fish. <laughs> but why are they among so many people? You need to send this crowd home. And instead, Jesus said, no, we're going to feed the crowd. And he makes distribution. And there, that day, he, he feeds 5,000 men besides women and children with five loaves of bread and two fish. And they had leftovers. And finally, it is then that Jesus says to his disciples, look, I want you to go ahead of me in Galilee. Go before me, and I'm going to dismiss the crowd, and then I'm going to go to the mountain to pray. He's going to go to that solitary place to pray. And our text begins with this statement. Immediately, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. I don't know whether you have ever thought about this or not, but obedience to Christ, obedience to the will of God, obedience to the commandments of God, sometimes bring storms into our lives. People who think that doing the will of God somehow protects them and covers them and canopies them from ever having a trouble, ever having a problem, ever having any discord in their lives, really fail to understand that sometimes it is doing the will of God that brings the greatest discomfort. It is doing the will of God that brings the greatest heartaches. It is doing the will of God and fulfilling the will of God that sometimes brings the greatest pain. I find it interesting that, that Matthew uses this word. In the King James or the New King James is the word made. In other translations is the word he commanded. In another translated Translation is the word compelled. I mean, it's as though the disciples didn't have any choice in the matter. Boys, I want you to get on the boat and I want you to go to the other side and wait on me. I want you to do it and I want you to do it right now. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego ended up, up in the fiery furnace. Why? In obedience to the will of God. Stephen was stoned to death. Why? Because he was a man that was filled with the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of God was so evident and radiant upon him that just the very sight of him, let alone his words, brought conviction upon the lives of others. And he was stoned to death by a group who had a man by the name that became known as Paul who helped their cloaks while Stephen was being stoned. But it was Stephen while he was being stoned said, Behold, I, I, I see Jesus standing on the right hand of God. I mean, my, my. Think about it. John. John was exiled to the island of Patmos because the Roman emperor thought he was attempting to overthrow his government. Because John preached about another kingdom that was going to come and envelope and take over the earth. The will of God brings storms into our lives. Jesus is in prayer. The wind is blowing. The waves are rocking. Jesus is a present Jesus is in prayer. And then we are told that the disciples were in the middle of the sea, tossed by waves, for the wind was contrary. Did you ever stop to think that some of the winds, some of the troubles, some of the difficulties we have in life 
are simply acts of nature, nothing more, nothing less, but they bring a lot, a lot of problems to us. Um, I'm trying to just give you three little pictures of the Sea of Galilee. In order for you to understand what is taking place within this text, the Sea of Galilee really was a, a very prone to storms and still is very prone to storms. It's situated in what is known as the Jordan River Valley region. It's a rift that runs through the country. The valley is very green in the springtime. In the dry season, it's very brown. And whether it's green or brown, the, the Sea of Galilee itself is a very deep blue. And that blue water reflects Someone one, some, one time said that, that when the valley is green, it's as though God put a sapphire right in the middle of an emerald. It is just a gorgeous, gorgeous place. When one is standing on the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee, you can literally, and I've had the opportunity to do it about four or five times, but when you're standing on the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee, you can see the whole sea. It's visible to you. It's not as though there's something that's prohibiting your sight from seeing the whole sea at, at one glance. Circling the Sea of Galilee, on the western slopes and roundabout are what's known as the Hills of Galilee. And the Hills of Galilee rise up to about 1,400 feet above sea level. On the other side, which is right some of what you see in here, on the other side is what's known as the Goyan Heights. And those heights on the eastern side rise up to about 2,500 feet above sea level. One side 1,400 feet, the other side 2,500 feet. And then the Sea of Galilee is sitting below them at 700 feet below sea level. Whoa. So when the winds come from the east, over the Goyan Heights, those high mountains from Mount Horb and other areas, when that cold wind comes from the, from the east, it suddenly hits the water which is hot and the heat begins to rise and the cold begins to fall and all of a sudden the waves begin to come upon the sea and the sea becomes very, very stormy. It's a place where there is violence, natural violence. <laughs> you know what? Have you ever had hard times because of natural violence? I remember one morning, Beth and I, on a Saturday morning, being awakened. About four o'clock in the morning and being told you have one hour to get out of your house and take everything you want to take with you because flood water is coming one hour. That's all you have. And my, my, by that afternoon, water had flooded the whole community where we were living. <laughs> Amazing thing is, water had flooded the whole community except the home we lived in and the church that we were pastoring and the water just got up to the front door of the church. We were just on this little ridge. But other people were not that fortunate. Tornadoes come. We have no control over them. We who live here in the Midwest understand the violence of a tornado. A micro blast comes. It blows down trees and it upsets homes. We understand it happens. By the way, natural things happen like the aging process. I mean, as much as we may not like it, the aging process sometimes brings its own storms. The chest falls into its drawers. Uh, the hair turns gray, it, it turns loose. And all of a sudden, we're looking for ways to try to hide and ways to make what nature is doing to us not look so bad. Now, Beth said this to me today. I didn't say this. She says, as long as my hair holds paint, it's going to have paint on it. 
You understand what I'm saying? I didn't say that. She said that. Nature has a way of bringing its own difficulties. Yes, obedience, acts of nature. But now, notice this. It was the fourth watch of the night, which means it was between 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock in the morning. Jesus sees those disciples, and he begins to walk toward them on the sea. And when the disciples saw him, the scripture says, when they saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. I find something interesting here. Did you notice that when the waves were just rocking the boat and some of the bad stuff was happening, they're not filled with fear, but as soon as they see Jesus coming towards them and it looks like it's a ghost, then they are filled with fear. I love a statement that uh, Mark Twain one time said. He said, I have been through some terrible things in my life, some of which actually happened. And what he was saying is, my mind has thought about a lot of things that were bad, terrible, that were going to happen, that should happen, that were going to take place, that never did occur. It's amazing sometimes how when things begin to occur in life, if we are not careful, our imagination begins to take over and all of a sudden our mind, our imagination makes things a whole lot worse than they really are. Devil sometimes, he uses our minds and our imaginations against us. I, I have shared this before, but I feel the need to share it again. Beth, a few years ago, went through what some of you ladies have gone through, some breast cancer issues. And I remember while she was going through chemotherapy and, and, and really having some hard times, she would take chemo on Friday afternoon and she would usually go to sleep and she would sleep from Friday afternoon to Sunday afternoon. And then it was like she'd wake up and get back to things and go to work on Monday morning. And we did that just simply because we felt like that was the best thing for her to do. But boy, at night times, for some reason, it didn't matter what was going on. At night times, she would say, at night times, the devil really does come out. In the nighttime, he begins to give me all kinds of imaginations. In the nighttime, he whispers in my ears, you're not going to live, you're going to die. In the nighttime, he says, you got a young grandson, you're never going to see him grow up. You're never going to see him start high school. In the nighttime, he would come in and try to discourage me, beat me down, and beat me up. In the nighttime, my imagination would begin to imagine all all kinds of things, to perceive all kinds of illnesses, to perceive all kinds of problems, to perceive all kinds of things that never happened and that never occurred. And let me tell you something, Beth Barber is not the only one that that occurs to. In fact, it happens to every one of us in this room at some point and sometime. You have a disagreement with somebody and all of a sudden you see them over there and they're talking to Sally Sue and you just know they're over there talking about you. All of a sudden you begin to have all kinds of imagination what people are thinking about you, saying about you, what kind of conversations they have about you and everything else. I'm telling you, my friend, the winds come. The winds blow and the difficulties come and when they do, our minds or our imaginations kick into overgear and if we're not careful, they become worse within our minds than they are in reality. Obedience. Acts of nature. But now that, what, what, watch this. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, be a good cheer in his eye. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Well, Lord, if it's you, uh, command me to come to you. So he said, What? Come. Now then, I know that we could sit here and uh, we can 
argue about whether Peter walked upon the water and why he didn't walk upon the water and all this. I'm not into that today. I'll cover that in a few weeks. But what I want you to recognize is this. Peter, Peter took it upon himself. He made a request to Jesus. Jesus granted his request. Peter was a man who was often impulsive. Peter was a man who often acted and then thought. Peter was a man who really sometimes made some very poor decisions in life. And sometimes some of the problems you and I experience in life are simply a result of the things that either we ask God for or we sought for ourselves or we ventured out and just took it upon ourselves. No one made us make that decision. No one asked us to make that decision. We made a decision and it was a bad decision. It's just that simple. Uh, Garth Brooks used to have a song that I thought was a pretty good song, especially for Garth Brooks, and it said, uh, thank God for unanswered prayers. And what he say, was saying is sometimes when God didn't answer my prayer, he saved me from a whole lot of problems. But you know what? Sometimes we pray and ask for things and God in His goodness and grace gives them to us and we didn't realize what we were asking for. And sometimes, let's just admit it, all the signs said that you shouldn't have spent that money, but boy, it just looked and felt so good and gave you so much joy to buy it. It's not God's fault. You can stand back and talk about being God's fault. It wasn't God. You made a decision. Organizations are suffering all over the place because of decisions that they made. People are suffering all over the place because of decisions that they made. I mean, people are drug addicts. People are are in prison, people are addicted to other items simply because of an impulsive decision they made all of a sudden. You know it, and I know it. And the sad thing is, sometimes those impulsive decisions and were not made by us, but made by other people that impacted us. But it was still a faulty decision. Let me give you an example. The Old Testament, there's this, this, this prophet who doesn't have four chapters written about him, but his name is Jonah. God calls him to go and be his prophet to preach the word to the Ninevites. Instead of doing that, Jonah says, forget it, I'm going to go the other direction. God is calling me west, I'm going to go east. So he goes, he gets in the boat, he gets in this boat, they begin to sail, and all of a sudden, there's a strong wind, and there's a boisterous wind, and the waves begin to roll, and the, the, the people on top in that ship were convinced that they were going to die. And so the sailors got together, and they said, come and let us cast lots and find out who's responsible for this calamity. Who brought this upon us? And they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Hey, these mariners thought they were going to die. It wasn't their fault. But there is on a ship with a man who is at fault. And finally, the seas kept on getting rougher and rougher. And, and Jonah finally says to them, just pick me up and throw me into the sea and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. There's not a parent that lives that at some point in time probably does not get their heart broken because of a decision their child, their grandchild makes. Storms come, 
Not because it's what we will for them, because of their decisions. And there's nothing we can do about it. But we have to live with the storm. You got me? It's a storm that we have to live with because of a decision somebody else made in life. There's been a many of a mother that has gone to bed at night and cried and shed tears because her son or daughter were sitting in prison with no hope of ever getting out and it broke her heart in two. Well, Peter made a decision. And he started to sink and he cried out and said, Lord, save me. And then we are told these words. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and called him and said, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now then, let me simply say here today, this may or may not have been a rebuke. In fact, it just may have been a statement of fact. Peter, you're a man. You're a man of little faith, but you have some faith. You have a little faith. Why didn't you use that little faith to trust me? Why did you start doubting when you saw the boisterous wind and you saw the waters coming against you? Let me just simply say Satan delights in using any storm to destroy our faith. Satan will use any storm to cause us to doubt and question God. Perhaps one of the greatest examples of this all, this fact, is found in a man by the name of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was actually a first cousin to Jesus Christ. And when Mary, Jesus' mother, found out that she was pregnant with child, if you recall, she went to see her cousin by the name of Elizabeth. And Elizabeth was pregnant with child too. And as soon as Mary and Elizabeth met, John leaped within his mother's womb. And Elizabeth says to Mary, she says, you know what? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. That baby somehow unbeknownst to us recognize that within Mary was the Messiah who had come to redeem the world. When Jesus is ready to start his public ministry, it is this John, John the Baptist, who sees him afar off and says, Behold, there's the Lamb of God. He's come to take away the sins of the world. And yet it is this John who gets arrested and thrown into prison. And he sends two of his disciples to Jesus with this question. Are you the coming one? Or do we look for another? In that prison cell, John begins to struggle with the issues of his faith. This one who as a unborn child leaped within his mother's womb. This one who baptized Christ. This one who when he beheld him said, there's the Lamb of God that coming to take away the sins of the world. This one that knew that the above all, this was the Messiah who had come. Yet, yet when the storms came, issues began to creep upon his faith and he started to question and wonder about God. Storms. You either been through one, you're in one, or bless your heart, God may be preparing you to go through one. It may be because of obedience. It may be because of an act of nature. It may be because of your own imagination. It may be because of decisions that have been made. It may be because of faith issues. You know, this wasn't the first storm the disciples had experienced with Jesus. I'll come back to this storm next week. But this wasn't the first storm that they had experienced with Jesus. There's a storm before this one. 
Matthew records it. Mark records it. And I like to share the experience as Mark shares it. He says, On the same day when evening had come, Jesus said to them, Out there on the Sea of Galilee, Let us cross over to the other side. And when they had left the multitude, they took him along in a boat as he was. And other little boats were also with him. And a great windstorm arose and waves beat into the boat so that it was already filling. I mean, you get the picture? It's filling with water. But catch this. But Jesus was in the stern asleep on a pillow. The storms are raging. The disciples are roaring. They're trying to bail out the boat. And this one that they have trusted to be the Messiah is sound asleep as though nothing's happened. Have you ever felt that way? With the storms of life? And they awoke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Just want to stop there a moment and look. Don't want you to move the slide yet. Just stay there a moment. Then, when it seems as though hell is bringing all of its fury, when it seems as though there's no hope in sight, when it seems as though there is no one to dry our tears, when it seems as though our brothers and sisters in Christ have all forsaken us, when it feels as though Jesus is in the stern of the boat, sound asleep while the waves are raging, while the winds are blowing, then, then, then all of a sudden the picture changes. You go from a wild stormy sea to the next photo, which is also of the sea of Galilee. He woke up and rebuked the wind and says, Peace! Be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. When you're reading it in the Greek, Jesus reaches out and He grabs hold of the wind and He muzzles it. He stops it. It can't do anymore. It can't blow anymore. It cannot huff anymore. It cannot come against you anymore because the master of the wind has it muffled. It's chained. It cannot move. And when it cannot move, the sea becomes calm. Boy, I tell you what, I mean this sincerely. There's been many a time in my life that I wish Jesus muzzle this storm. Muzzle this wind. Well, I'd like to share with you one more slide this morning. When Jesus muzzles it, sometimes He doesn't muzzle it the way we thought He would. Jesus may literally calm your storm. Or Jesus may just choose to calm you in the midst of the storm. Jesus may stand and shout to the storm that's raging against you, Peace! Be still. Or Jesus may choose to snuggle up in the very recesses of your heart and your innermost being where all of your affections are and just whisper, peace, peace.
peace. Settle down. Be still. Peace. I've got control. It's in my hands. I can muzzle it. Just let me do it. Peace. Peace. Just, just let me work on my calendar. Peace. Peace. Let me work on my time schedule. Peace. Peace. Scott Cropain has a song that's entitled Sometimes He Calms the Storms. The words are up here and they go like this in the chorus. Sometimes He calms the storms with a whisper, Peace, be still. He may settle the sea, but it doesn't mean He will. Sometimes he holds us close and lets the wind and the waves go wild. Sometimes he storms, he calms the storm. And sometimes he calms his child. Whether he calms you on the inside or the outside, he can muzzle the storm. Let us pray. Lord, we know You as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We know You as a God who is involved within creation and a God who has power over creation. We know You as a God, a God who when the worst times comes is a God of peace, and a God who whispers stillness to ourselves. May you help someone this day to make a decision to quit carrying the wind and weathering the storm by themselves and lay it all at the foot of the cross. May you give someone the courage today to just simply say, I'm tired of it. Lord, it's yours. May your will be done within our lives. Amen. I know. This older area is close, but we've got front pews here, we've got pews there. I just want you to know, this is a place where you can find peace in the time of trouble. This is a place you can find peace within the midst of the storm. If you need that peace today, hey, we invite you to come. Let us pray. Let us stand. i
sang it before us. There's peace in the time of trouble. is over us, even when we are unaware that He's got His eyes upon us. No song that says that His eyes upon the sparrow. And I know He watches me. We are grateful that God watches over us. Mark, will you dismiss us with prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today thanking you for another day of life, dear Lord. Uh, we thank you for the message Brother Ray brought to us today. I know it really hit home to me. Uh, thank you for the song service today and Pam's song at the end. As, uh, it just How it all just tied together and flowed together today, dear Lord. Just uh, It was really, really heartfelt and uh, just means a lot to me. Just uh, please go with uh, us throughout this week. Uh, please be with any prayer or concerns that were mentioned. And, uh, those that uh, we all hold dear to our heart, dear Lord, just please forgive me when I fail thee. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen.